Father and our loving God in heaven. We count it a privilege when you personally invite us to dine with you and to partake of the heavenly manna. After our struggles throughout this week, we want to refill our cups. We want to re-energize our spiritual journey. We want to cement our relationship with you in worship you, in prayer, in offering, in song. And now we want to listen to the address from heaven. We pray that I may represent heaven well today and that all our particular and individual needs may be met through the word that we will study. It is in Jesus name we pray, amen. All right, let me ask what picture do we have of our God? What picture do we have of our God? This comes in the background of what we were studying in our quarterly, in our lesson. And I had, we discussed so much about fearing God. And today I want to bring to us a picture that we might have somehow missed of who exactly God is. And so I will make use of Luke chapter 11 and beginning with verse 1. Uh, the gospel according to Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. By the way, before I go into that text, let me remind us that in my search for exactly what humanity yearns for, of the, of the uh, things that humanity is struggling with, they have three major challenges that humanity is battling with. Number one is how do I escape from death? Number two, how does justice prevail? How do I get to a point where justice prevails? In every argument, be it in the school, in the home, in the church, in the marketplace, if you listen carefully, you will hear people yearning for justice. I deserve this. I desire justice to be done. And the other third principle that is looked at philosophically at what humanity desires down in our hearts, it is to have communion with the everlasting father. And lastly, to have love forever. And they got married and they lived happily ever after. And so in these issues, before Jesus Christ came, humanity was struggling with two major problems. And the number one problem was how it was a distorted picture of who God was. And number two, because of our sin, this put in us a picture that is distorted about God. And because of this distorted view of God, God sent his son so that he can reveal to us who exactly God is. And so Jesus came as the light to enlighten the world. And so that he can show us who exactly God is as I ask, what is your picture 
of God today. So everybody wants justice. Everyone wants to have love in the home. Everybody wants to see justice triumph. Everybody wants to be in touch with the eternal. And so religion, religion of all kinds, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, humanity wants to be in touch with this God. And so here we have the question, what picture do we have of God? Let's go to the book of Luke and see what Christ does. Chapter uh, 5, uh, chapter 11 and verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Not how to pray, but to pray. Just as John taught the disciples. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Very, very important statement that Jesus begins. Now, mind you, when you read the history of the Jews, these were people who were prayer warriors. They would pray all the time in the marketplace at home. Prayer was part of their life. But when they saw the power that was in Jesus and they discovered that the power came from prayer, one of his disciples said, we want that power and we want you to teach us to pray. And then he said, our father. Why did he use this word father? If you go to the Old Testament, you'll discover that the word father is used only 15 times, one five. 15 times only in the Old Testament, the word father. And when it is used, not in times when someone is praying, but for some other reason. And so they give the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jehovah, the commander of the army of Israel. And so they don't want to give God the word Father, but Christ comes here and says, when you pray, say our Father. And you will discover from that time, after the Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, that word is used now in the New Testament 165 times. Now they start using the word Father because Jesus is telling them that this God that you want to be in touch with, that you want justice, that you want love eternal, he is your Father. And the word that he uses is Abba, which Romans in the book of Romans chapter eight, use us later when we'll come to see what that means. And so he says, when you are praying, say our father, he is your dad. Remove that picture you have of God as being transcendent, as being very far. He is near to you. He is your friend. He understands you and he wants the world to be lighted so that they can understand who exactly God is. And so he says, our father. And then the prayer goes down, give us today our daily bread and, and, and deliver us from the evil one because he is Jehovah Jireh, the one who gave the Israelites bread for the 40 years, who provided sandals on their feet, who provided clothes. He is that father. He is a giver of good gifts. He is a dad. Don't fear him. He is closer to you. You can touch him. You can talk to him. He is your father. And he continues. Then Jesus said, and that was five. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are 
and my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, verse 8, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, he yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, for many years, I've been thinking about this parable that Jesus gave. He said, suppose a friend comes in the middle of the night and he has no bread. And now, many times we conclude that the lesson we are learning, it is pray unceasingly. And sometimes we see all these things on the WhatsApp push, which, which, which is translated, pray until something happens. So if something has not happened, keep on pushing, keep on praying, keep on pressing, keep on asking, keep on cutting yourself, keep on uh, crying in tears and ask God, keep on pushing and knock, then God will open the door for you. But unfortunately, let me give you my version and the lesson that I learned from here today. Let me tell you, it is a friend's business. If there's nothing that you can learn, when Christ says, our father, he is our daddy, Abba father, and he gives this parable of a man who has no bread in the middle of the night, and he goes to ask from a friend, let me tell you, if you not get anything from this sermon, just take this lesson home. It is a friend business. What Christ wanted us to learn, it is a friend business. Because what happens, a friend comes to a friend, and this friend goes to a friend. And then what is the end result? And because he is his friend, he will be able to wake up, even though he keeps on knocking. And even though he keeps on telling him, don't bother me, just go away. I'm, I'm, I'm asleep and my children, you know, when you think about the bed in those times, there were actually no beds and they will sleep on the floor. And if you will wake up, you will step on the children. And because you are pushing, you are asking open. It's not because he was pushing too much, but it is just because of friendship. And he says, just because he's a friend, he will wake up and give him bread. Now let's rush to verse 13. It says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? Now, something that I've discovered in Luke chapter 11 is that the direction of Jesus Christ, yes, we need clothes. Yes, we need a home. Yes, we need food. Yes, we need all these necessities that he has included in his prayer. But he says the apex on top of the mountain, on top of our, our requests, on top of our, our, our desire, it is to pray because God is willing to give us the Holy Spirit. I wish I were near, I would have asked everybody to stand up in church and say, Holy Spirit. I never understood this. And this is the direction. Yes, you know, if you go and Google on the texts that are used most, we all have memorized the Lord's Prayer. And we can say it off head, our Father who art in heaven, Allah be thy name. Everybody will say the Lord's Prayer. But we forget that the direction Jesus was leading us is into the Holy Spirit. Now, let me rush you into the book of Romans chapter 8, and then we check something here before we could uh, find out what Jesus is talking about. Romans chapter 8, and it's another text that is very common. Now, when I was doing Google to find out which are the most uh, uh, loved texts in the scripture, this Roman chapter 8, it is number 4 of 10. We have Roman, we, we have the Lord's Prayer, which we have memorized. We have John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And so we have here Romans chapter 8. 
And I know sometimes I've been using these texts when I have a bereavement, when someone is sick, I just go to their home and I go to verse 28. And what does it say? Chapter Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Let me read this verse to you here in your hearing. Verse 24, I'm here now in 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. Who doesn't love that text? When you have lost your loved one, when you've been involved in an accident, when you have lost all that you had, someone comes to you and it reminds you of Romans chapter 8 and verses 28. I know that all things work together for the good. Everything will be okay. You know, even if she's died, you know, all these uh, words that we try to use, like just Job's friends when we want to comfort, we use this text. Let me give you a secret today. Open your Bibles, wherever you are, whether it's your phone or your iPad or your literal Bible, just get your Bible and we study in the next few minutes that are remaining before I close so that we can check something here that I have discovered is the greatest secret that I wish I had the power to propose that this be the 29 fundamental believers of the Seventh day Adventists. We have 28, but yes, we have the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity, but there's something that I have always been missing out that I want to share with you today. Who is God? What has he done? Romans chapter eight. Are you there? If you are there, unmute and say amen. I want you to be with your Bible and you open to the book of Romans chapter eight. We connect it with Luke chapter 11 and verse 13. Check that text out. Eight, okay? Eight. I amen. can only see the, the picture of Zambi uh, and I can Man. Yes, yes, I can hear some Oh, yes, thank you so much. I can hear you now. Now, I'll give you an assignment. Go through Romans chapter 8 and underline where you will see the word spirit. Underline. Go through it and see where the word spirit is mentioned. I want to give you assignment, okay? Now, uh, Elder Mainye, where are you? Which verse have you found the spirit in Romans chapter eight? Uh, the first verse. Wonderful. Any other person, Elijah? Which verse? Yes, the one in the second verse. Okay, the second verse. Next person, Elder Momani. Okay, let me help you, verse four. I'll go to verse five. I'll go to verse six. I'll go to verse nine. I'll go to verse 11. Anyone else who has seen? El Machuki, where are you? I'm almost there. Which part? <laughs> You're not there yet? Not yet. Okay, 13, you're right. 14. Anyone who has seen the word spirit? 14, you're right. 15. Anyone else? 17, you've, you've skipped 16. There's the spirit there. Next. 20, let me help you. 23, let me help you. 26, 27, let's move on. 32 and 35 and this text we just pull it out and use it out of context only on verse 28 that all things work together but Paul has come to the apex to the top of his discussion and he starts to say therefore there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus in verses two, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit, what does the spirit do now? 
if you now check carefully now let's see what the spirit does number one through the holy spirit we are not condemned amen i have sinned like paul says in roman chapter 2 3 verses 23 all have sinned but because of this spirit i am not condemned number two the law of the spirit gives me life what gives me life yes god created me but it is the spirit that gives me life verses four in order that the righteous re requirements might be fulfilled if i don't have the holy spirit i will not fulfill the requirements of the law yes the law is there justice will demand that i die because I have sinned, but because of the spirit, he helps me to fulfill all the righteousness of the law. I wish you could have said, amen. Verse five, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires am i communicating church are we together yeah we are together pastor all right amen and now what does the spirit do he helps me to fulfill the requirements of the law and then i live according to the spirit and i set my mind on the spirit and the mind that is governed by the spirit is death, uh, by the flesh is death, but the spirit is life. So what is this spirit? It is life. Verse nine, you however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you and anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ because of his spirit. We belong to Christ. And I know that I belong to Jesus Christ. Verses 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, he is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8. And if he raised Jesus Christ, I will also be resurrected. I don't have to fear death. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the spirit he has put to death the midst of the body, you will live. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I know that I am a child of God because I ask for the Holy Spirit. I am led by the Holy Spirit. He has made me to fulfill all the requirements of the law. He has given me life and I have hope or resurrection because of the Spirit of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you to be slaves. Listen, church, one of the greatest evangelists in the history of the world left the United States, went to China. He worked for God day and night, sometimes in prison, sometimes in peril, sometimes sleeping in the cold night, translating the Bible in their languages. He was working for God day and night. And when he came back to the United States to retire, he said, I have preached to the, the whole world, but I have not been preached to myself. Why? It's because he was serving God as his slave. The Muslims serve God as their slave. The Hindus have pictures of an angry God. And this man, a Christian, had known, had known not the picture of God. He was serving God. Some of us are in the church today because you are afraid, because you are coming to him, because he will hit you. He will not bless you this year. He will not make you to earn enough money. He will not make you to have a good education. He will not bless you. He will not do this. And so you come to church. And so you are serving God with fear as a slave. If I ask you to give me the definition of who a Christian is, I don't know what definition you will give me, but one of the greatest authors of books, he has said that a Christian, a Christian is that one 
who has known God as a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Verse 14, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. What he does, he testifies with my spirit that I am God's child. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Now let me tell you, there are three kinds of groaning in the book of Romans chapter 8. Number one, the creation. It is groaning. We're talking so much about climate change, about climate change. I don't want to go into those details. The creation is groaning. Number two, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage, that is verse 21, uh, to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right to the present time. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inside of us. Let me tell you, church, as I'm talking to you today, I am groaning. I am crying. Something happened this week. My brother's son was knifed by my brother's son. I'm going to bury him the week that is beginning today. A son takes a knife and kills five members of his family. You can read what is happening today. Terrorism, climate change, domestic violence, dangerous. Even now, it is not safe to be a teacher in school. You are not safe at your home with your children. We are groaning. The number three groaning I want to give to you today, it is the groaning of the Holy Spirit. He says, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. In the same way, now listen. Jesus is saying in verse 13 of the book of Luke that you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How about your father in heaven? How will he not give you everything, but mostly the Holy Spirit? Why did Jesus center on the Holy Spirit? Because it is everything to a Christian. Is verse 26. In the same way, why does Paul speak in the same way? If I am groaning today, I don't know what you are going through, my brother, my sister. Maybe you have reached a point where you know and you are thinking that God has forgotten you. Childlessness, raising up children who are wayward, and faithfulness in the home, poverty all around, sickness and death. I don't know what you are going through, but I want to tell you, as I groan, I am encouraged today. I'm as you are encouraged this morning, that the same way you are groaning, something is happening. The Holy Spirit is also groaning. It is crying also. In, in ways that I, I am just talking, I'm opening my mouth, I am talking, but the Holy Spirit is groaning. The Holy Spirit is groaning for my own challenges to ensure that I remain the child of God. And now we say here, and who searches our hearts, he knows our mind. The spirit, because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What a powerful, the top of what Paul was reasoning philosophically about the, the life of a Christian. And now we, we come to verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things. Verse 38, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or short? Yes, those things will be this year. Yes, you will face persecution. Yes, you will face nakedness. 
Yes, you will face danger this year. Yes, you will face trouble. I will tell you from the mm -hmm. word of God, we will face this. But Jesus in Paul, he says, who shall separate? That means all these things will come. They will not separate us from the love of God. Why? It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit who has now sealed my eternal glory. And now because of this, we can go down and now read verses 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I am convinced, church. If you are not, I am convinced. If today you will leave the church not being con con convinced, that's your problem. But today, it doesn't matter what you know about me. It doesn't matter what is going to come in my life. But I want to tell you, I am convinced in all these things. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. For I am convinced again that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of the lord my god jesus christ why because the holy spirit has assured he has tied me with jesus christ I wish you could do your finger like this as something that Makambi, I can see you just do your finger like this. The Holy Spirit has sealed my relationship with Jesus Christ. And because of that, I cannot be separated. Yes, there will be heights, there will be depths, there will be things present. Even the things that are coming in the future, another strain of COVID, I will not fear. Why? Because all things will work together because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I pray for the Holy Spirit. Do one thing. Be conscious of his presence. Be conscious of his presence. Be obedient and pray for him. Don't live a day without praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. He is everything. Jesus is saying, ask our Father. He is the Abba Father. He cries to, for on our behalf. For he is our high priest who has gone before. He has done miracles and he will do. He will work in ways that we cannot understand because God will make a way. Because the Holy Spirit has sealed my relationship with Jesus Christ. Come what may, 2021, my life in Christ is secure. It's my prayer. Leave this church today being convinced that there's nothing that will separate you from the love of God. It's my prayer for you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and let the church amen. say, amen. Amen, amen. Now let's 